Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Tell me when, CJ. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. I'm also a corporate officer. I'd like to welcome everyone to our event here at CSIS on diversity in defense, development, and diplomacy. And we're doing this event in the context of historically Black college and university career advancement. Uh, I'm really pleased to be hosting this event, and I'm really grateful for all my colleagues who, who are going to be on this panel and, and help it, helping us make this possible. Um, let me start with the following that I believe that the diversity of, of the people of the United States is a strategic asset of the United States. I can think of my friend Aaron Williams, who was uh, the first USAID mission director in post-apartheid South Africa, happened to be African-American. I think that was a really powerful and important signal. I also think about folks like Ambassador Gary Locke, who was the first Chinese American ambassador to the People's Republic of China. He stood in line and got his own Starbucks. He carried his own suitcase like any other gringo would do. And that blew, that was a cultural moment. There were multiple cultural moments because of Ambassador Locke just being, happened to being a Chinese American. These are important. It had, the diversity of our people is a great strength and is something that the United States needs to be doing a better job of tapping into. We're doing this in the context of, um, as well as thinking about how we can recruit young people for the next generation in foreign affairs and national security roles. And that's, that's we wanna encourage young people from uh, for across, uh, across the totality of our country to consider serving in the intelligence community, serving in the diplomatic community, serving in, in international development, serving in the armed forces. And so this discussion, we're gonna be bringing in a perspective about historically black colleges and universities, better known as HBCUs. It's very relevant. There are over 100 HBCUs that serve nearly 300,000 students from around the world. And uh, these institutions undoubtedly diversify America's workforce and strengthen our country's foreign policy capabilities in defense, development, and diplomacy. Of course, as I think we all know, US Vice President-elect is Senator Kamala Harris is a graduate of Howard University, an HBCO here in Washington, D.C. Um, but you know, at the same time, we probably we I think it's fair to say we need some improvement in diversity um, in the foreign affairs and national security space. Uh, only four percent of international politics scholars in the United States identify as Black, Afro-Caribbean, or African American, despite making up more than fourteen percent of the U.S. population. Um, there, we got, we've got some work to do. So um, our discussion today will address how to increase access and understanding about entering public service for minority students, particularly those enrolled at, enrolled at historically black colleges and universities. We'll also discuss the complex hiring practices for many US government agencies. Now let's get to the discussion. Please join me in welcoming. I've got, I've got a great set of panelists. We have my friend, Ms. Eno Abong, who is um, Head of Strategic Partnerships for the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream. Eno is also somebody who had a role, it was the Deputy Director at the US Trade and Development Agency. You'll hear about that. I'm really pleased to have Ms. Julie Chung, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. She's had a very distinguished career in the Foreign Service, um, and she wrote a very Im uh, impactful article in the Foreign Service Journal that um, made a big impression on me. I'd also like to welcome Mr. Chris Richardson. Uh, Chris is a former Foreign Service Officer with the Department of State and wrote a very, it got a lot of attention op-ed in the New York Times about uh, diversity and inclusion at the, at the US State Department. He's currently the General Counsel and Chief Operating Officer for BDV Solutions. I'm really also grateful to my friend and colleague, Mr. Juan Cruz is a Senior Advisor here at CSIS. He was formerly special assistant to the president and senior director for Western Hemisphere Affairs, but he also had a, a more than 30 year distinguished career um, in, in, the, in, uh, in government. Um, he started his career though as an intern at CSIS more than 30 years ago, he started as a child prodigy. So, but, and so he's come full circle and come back as a senior advisor. So I'm really grateful to Juan. 
And I'd also like to welcome, uh, is it T Tania, right? Tania, Tania Navas, who is Navas, who is Tania is the director of the Ralph J. Bunch International Affairs Center at Howard University. We're very grateful that, that she agreed to join us and is going to help us um, provide some additional per academic perspectives and HBCU perspective of this conversation. So I want to turn now the floor over to my friend and colleague, Nicole Andal. Nicole joined CSIS this year as the director of the Diversity and Leadership in International Affairs program here at CSIS, which is dedicated to elevating diverse voices and perspective to lead to lead to more ideas, more innovation, and more robust policy solutions. So thanks everybody. Um, uh, audience members are gonna be encouraged to submit any questions to our panelists by using the Ask Questions Here button on the event webpage. Now, Nicole, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Thanks so much, Nicole, for helping me with this. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. This is a, a great event and I'm really happy that we're holding this. Let me start by saying that I am a proud Howard University bison. So is my baby sister, my parents. My other sister is a Morgan State Fair, but we, we still love her. She's still part of the family. <laughs> Though our careers have taken us in completely different directions, our HBCU experiences gave us the tools, courage, and pride to forge ahead and thrive. Now, when I graduated armed with a degree in Russian studies from Howard, I expected to easily walk into a foreign affairs career. Now this was the early 90s and so a lot had changed and I was very eager to take my new, very uh, relevant degree and walk right into the State Department or somewhere else in the government. But it proves to be much harder for me than for my contemporaries from other schools in the area. I had a lot, I had to do a lot more to you know, build my credentials. I had to self-fund a study abroad <laughs> after, uh, Graduating, and are we having a little bit of a sound issue or am I, okay now. Um, and the foreign service really seemed to be out of reach. I could not afford an unpaid internship. And I believe the trope that I needed more experience for jobs, but I saw equally inexperienced students from other schools getting the jobs right after graduating. So of course, when I started my career with the Department of Energy later as a foreign affairs specialist, it was no surprise to me how few faces of color I saw amongst my peers or supervisors. I mean, there were folks here and there, but definitely more at other agencies, and they seem to be more concentrated in certain departments. For those of us in the national security space, finding another person of color at the GS-11 or higher was kind of like spotting a unicorn. I liken it to my experience studying abroad in Ukraine, because it didn't matter where we came from, we always seemed to find each other. So here we are 70 years after Ralph Bunch received the Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating a ceasefire between Israelis and Palestinians, still discussing how to increase diversity in international affairs. So the barriers to entry were there, but some of us got through. Now we could relax and just get to work, right? Well, diversity is one thing, but inclusion is an entirely different issue. Like all of today's speakers, I have stories for days. But here is one that happened early in my career that had the potential to derail my ambition. It was my first meeting with foreign partners. I was one of few junior staffers who were part of the US team. When we got to the room, the senior members of our team went out of their way to encourage all of the junior staff to sit at the table. I took the cue, started to put down my notebook at an open seat, when one of those same senior staffers told me to sit, on, sit along the wall. Now, do I need to point out that I was the only person of color in the room? I share this story for a couple of reasons. One, if we're gonna talk about recruitment, we need to talk about retention. Second, what impact could I have made on the difficult negotiations just by being at that table? I had a great idea about midway through the meeting, but I couldn't even share it with the junior staff who were all passing notes amongst themselves. Ralph Bunch affected a foreign policy and international relations breakthrough because he was given a seat at the table. When I left government for the aerospace and defense industry, I was literally blown away by the number of professionals of color at all levels at my new company. There were senior managers, subject matter experts, interns, mid-levels, and even division presidents of color, women CEOs. Now, I'm not trying to imply that the numbers were high or that everything was perfect, but I was no longer the only one in the room. And HBCU graduates, we were everywhere. So what gives? What is corporate America doing that the foreign policy and international affairs community seems to be struggling with? 
Well, in my opinion, it is because industry understands that diversity and inclusion is good for America, but it's equally good for business. Think about the most profitable and most respected companies. What makes them so great? Well, they're agile, they're, they adapt, and they innovate. They don't try to improve on a winner, but they also do not rest on their laurels. Because they know there are sharks out there, if they don't keep their customers happy, they will be dead in the water. Organizations are better when they have a broad range of perspectives involved in making decisions. They stay relevant and they make more money. Now think about it. Think about every foreign policy decision that has been made in the past 30 years. Wars, international assistance, international diplomacy, peacekeeping. Does it seem as if there's a foreign policy formula that prompts a lot of these plans? Well, let me tell you, as someone who's been in the room when decisions are made, it matters who is making that decision and it matters even more who they will listen to. And as our world becomes increasingly complex and global leadership becomes more diverse, the U.S. had better take a look at why it is, after all these years, we still have not been able to substantially and sustainably build and maintain a diverse workforce in international affairs. We need agility, we need to be adaptable, and we need to be innovative. And I don't need to tell you that the, pro the problem does not lie with the diverse hire. You know, we come and go, but we aren't magical. Ask Ruby Bridges if she was able to change the culture of William France Elementary School. Now, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm not touching the issues of pay equity, corporate culture, or work-life balance. My only point is that when you are purposeful and deliberate about diversity and inclusion, you will become a more diverse and inclusive organization. Companies got very deliberate about grabbing as much diverse talent as they could get their hands on. They didn't care what school you went to or where you were from. And if you proved yourself, you would be promoted. They were deliberate in their efforts. And HBCUs embrace corporate outreach and facilitate connections between students and corporate employers. That's why I can find so many compatriots in my corporate jobs. So it's time to get more deliberate. There are lots of efforts going on at Howard and other places where they're being really deliberate about re-energizing you know, our, our, our workforce in foreign affairs. With the upcoming changes in government, we are likely to see an increase in diverse leadership and a return to public service for civil servants who left in the past few years. At the same time, institutes of higher learning are launching ambitious diversity initiatives offering the best and the brightest from their ranks for internships and entry-level hires. So let's keep walking the walk. The international affairs community and HBCUs are uniquely poised to work together to change the trajectory so that our foreign policy and international engagements are agile, adaptable, and innovative. We will turn that corner when we, were all, when we are all invested. Thank you. You, you can see why I wanted to have my friend and colleague, Nicole, make some opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Nicole. That was really great. I really appreciate it. I'm really glad you've joined and that you're, you're a new colleague and I, I'm, you've been really hit the ground running. Thank you for being here and helping me with this. So I want to start with my friend, Eno Ebong, because Eno, um, when I reached out to her, I said, Eno, I want to work on this. I want to convene this group. She, she was very uh, helpful to me and gave me a, a lot of uh, useful ideas. So, Anna, I want to give you the floor first. Talk a little bit about how did you, you know, I, I mean, each, I've asked you to kind of prepare sort of an opening statement. So why, let me start with you, Anna, please. Thanks so much, Dan. And I just have to um, uh, really underscore how, Nicole, your, your remarks really touched on the universe of what we're talking about. Um, and I think put in very fine relief the importance of this whole endeavor. Everybody knows it is to our benefit as a country to have a workforce that looks um, like the world. And we have, we're in the unique position that we can actually do that as a country. So why not leverage it? It makes a difference. It makes a difference for negotiating deals. It makes a difference for um, excellent uh, uh, sort of security and, and intelligence information. It, it makes a difference all the way around. And, um, you know, I was in one of those positions where, you know, I experienced that as, as deputy director at the US Trade and Development Agency. And I will add that I started up um, as an aligned attorney advisor at the agency um, and you know, had the opportunity to rise to be deputy general counsel, general counsel, and then the deputy director. Well, um, I was in one of those situations
situations where we could not get a, a, a deal sort of closed um, with counterparts in Nigeria and in the private sector. I did not mention that I'm originally from Nigeria. And, um, you know, the, 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 the deal which was to do with getting equipment and, and private hospitals um, in Nigeria had just been going, you know, not very far. And ultimately, we had a meeting with all the principals, the Minister of Health, the Director General of the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, and I was in the room. And I simply started with a comment about recollecting as a nine-year-old being hospitalized at the Lagos Youth University Teaching Hospital and remembering the quality of care. And, you know, you could tell the shifted. I'm not saying that it was the reason that we got to solution, but there was an opening. Uh, and, and so the, the, the import of the diversity, um, you know, cannot be understated where you have a variety of views, you'll have a variety of options, and you will have a variety of conclusions. Um, so that, uh, that given, what can we do and what should we be thinking about as we approach this issue? Um, I had mentioned a bit earlier in talking to the other panelists, I think it's important to, to, to to remind everyone that there are lots of opportunities within government and without for doing excellent international work. Um, within government, because that's where I came from, there are a, a plethora of agencies, you know, think of departments of energy, of, of transportation, think of FAA, think of treasury, um, think of agriculture, who all do international work. And then there are um, executive agencies like the US Trade and Development Agency, the Export Import Bank of the United States, States, the Millennium Child Corporation, there are a lot. So it's incumbent on us, and, and I'll put my comments on what can be done in two buckets. There are small, immediate touch kind of things that can be done as a matter of course. And then maybe there's an intriguing new idea, perhaps, that we can think about whether something like this might help. On the small sort of approach, small sort of low-hanging fruit, I'll call it. Um, I think we do have to, in government, sort of shift our mindset a little bit from a process of selection to recruitment. Um, and, and I think that the private sector does this really well. Um, we are looking for people actively, um, and this means getting on websites, social media, um, using what we can to attract in a broad way. So stress our missions, stress our impact, stress the importance of our causes. Um, I think we should not just target job seekers, we should also look for people who are in jobs, um, who are highly qualified and might not think, but actually might be uh, extraordinary in the positions we, we have to offer. And um, just super quickly on, on, on more of that low hanging fruit, I think we should think about selection criteria. You know, Nicole mentioned it, we're always talking about experience and years of experience. Well, actually, is that that important or is really how you relate the experience to the mission more important. So we, we've got to think a little bit about that. And then the, the last thing in the small category I'll talk about is just money. We should pay interns, we should um, pay sort of per diem and transportation costs for interviews. I mean, this just is a simple way of leveling the playing field. Um, so I, I think there are things in that nature that can have been most a lot written about greatly that can be done. I think also that we might want to, to sort of think about, is there another way that we can approach this? So there are a lot of development programs, career programs um, uh, in government uh, and, and also work done by um, lots of organizations to really uh, you know, uh, get at this issue. I wondered whether, and this is a, a question really, but I put it out there, whether as some of the, 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 the changes are so hard to make, so it's sort of systemic what we're seeing in terms of difficulty in moving numbers, we should try a structural approach to the question. So is it time to look at um, the institution of a, a, a sort of national sort of junior professional program, a program that you know, goes across our agencies, but really focuses on benchmarking, on tracking, on monitoring, on making sure that there is a cadre of young people that we're bringing in to this environment. And that in a systematic kind of way, we are providing 
um, the training that they need for their work. I'm really thinking, and this has been done before, obviously, and most obviously in the multilateral context, like the um, Young Professional Program at the World Bank or the UN's Junior Professional um, Program, where you have just key features which exist now 100% in all of the programs that I know, uh, you know are in existence, but can we systematize, can we make it logical, can we make it um, easily accessible and visible? Um, and, and therefore make a difference in the professional experience. We pay the, the young people, obviously, in leadership development, in training of policies of the institutions, in rotations, in coaching and mentoring, sort of a one-stop shop um, that can um, funnel qualified um, uh, applicants through the process of building their careers in a variety of, of agencies. So I will pause there, I'm happy to discuss further, but um, thank you, Dan, for the opportunity. Thank you. I'd like to ask Julie Chung if you'd like to make an opening statement. Julie, please. Thank you, and thanks for having me today. You know, you talked about how diplomacy and uh, diversity is so important, and we can't do our jobs without representing all of America. So I think diversity has to be strategic, it has to be purposeful and it has to be deliberate in everything we do and, and very consistent. It's who we are as a country. And so we are the representatives. We are the faces of America to every country in the world, to the global community. And so it is rep representing who we are as a nation, but also it makes us help make better policies. As I wrote in, in the recent article of the Foreign Service Journal, I talked about being asked at every step of the way in my career uh, I want to talk to a real American. Who are you? And uh, having to address that as an immigrant, as a Korean American, as an Asian woman of color, that I am and a real American, and I'm a real American diplomat. And then taking that negative uh, response and turning it into positive, giving that opportunity to explain that immigrants make up so much of who we are. Uh, immigrants, refugees, people from every background, and then for us to take that message abroad to every country in the world, that is our strength. That is not soft diplomacy. I think that is strong diplomacy. And so I'm hoping to see more of that as we engage foreign audiences, but internally within the State Department as well. Now we have 16 uh, diplomats in residence across the nation, seven of them which are, um, who are placed at historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic in institutes. So it's important to go out there and recruit for a diverse workforce for the State Department. We have programs like the Pickering and Wrangell Fellowships. I joined the State Department uh, 24 years ago as the very first cohort of the Pickering Fellowship. And in addition to that, uh, the Una Chapman Cox Foundation has a great program working in conjunction with the State Department on demystifying and explaining what the Foreign Service can be to a diverse workforce. And they host events and recruit um, undergraduate students to come to the State Department, now virtually, unfortunately, but to explain and to meet leadership from across different agencies and to recruit and explain that we need every kind of uh, background of Americans in our State Department Foreign Service. Now, once you're recruited and enter the Foreign Service, we have to have a strong support team. Again, it's not just about recruitment, but retention and promotion. So we have 13 employee affinity groups, including the Thursday Luncheon Group, which is our oldest affinity group, established in 1973 by two African-American officers. And it's important to create that network, to mentor, to sponsor, because you know what? Right now we have in the entire world, three African-American ambassadors, four Hispanic ambassadors, and six Asian-American ambassadors out of almost 200 ambassador positions. That to me is not acceptable. That does not represent who we are as a nation. In addition to that, we have a great network. For those of you in HBCUs, we have the HBCU Foreign Policy Conference that we host every year. And we bring together uh, HBCU alumni and students and have a, a really thorough discussion in, in the interagency about how to thrive in that network and to bring more people through. And uh, in the Western Hemisphere Affairs Bureau, where I work, we have really emphasized not only the importance of diversity councils, which we are establishing throughout the hemisphere at all our embassies, uh, but also that retention, promotion, 
and how do we create that network uh, of really diverse officers. So we have now just launched a next generation fellows program to uh, an application program where we select, select mid-level officers and help them to be able to bid on senior positions and get promoted and really connect with senior officers within the building. We also just joined uh, with the Medical Bureau and the Western Hemisphere Bureau to do a 21 day racial equity challenge where we had really frank discussions on what it's like to be a Native American and Asian American and Hispanic and Black um, in our institution and in our society today. So uh, there are a wide range of programs that we are engaging in. Uh, it's not enough. I think we have a long way to go. But the fact that we've come this far and through such programs and affinity groups, uh, it's important that we keep our eye on the ball. And, and again, it has to be strategic and purposeful and deliberate. So from what I tell my stories to foreign audiences, it's really important for them to hear from, from those with, from every background. And I think that is our strength of diplomacy. And we have to just continue on that path. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thanks so much. Chris Richardson, uh, I'd like you to go ahead now, please. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everyone, for having me. Uh, this is a real honor to be here. Um, I, you know, I think every African American who's been in the Foreign Service has a story. But I think for me, the most important thing that we have to understand if we want to fix what hap what's happened at the State Department and in foreign policy is we have to understand historical context. And I think that historical context kind of shapes everything that we do and all of our decisions and how we move uh, in the world. And so, you know, the, the State Department for Foreign Service Officers, uh, we have an oral exam and a written exam. And that was all based out of the 1924, what's called the Rogers Act, which professionalized the Foreign Service. The thing that people don't realize is that the people who wrote the Rogers Act and the people who founded the initial Foreign Service to make it a professional organization, they did not design it for women, Black people, or, or naturalized Americans. And so when we talk about this idea of systemic racism, the founding of the State Department, the modern day State Department is actually a perfect example of what that actually means. So after the Rogers Act passes in 1924, one African-American Clifton Wharton Jr. actually applies for it, Clifton Wharton Sr. rather applies for it, and he gets through it. But the thing is that they didn't realize he was African-American. And so when the leaders of the Foreign Service found out that he was African-American, the reaction wasn't one of joy, it was not one of excitement, it was horror, it was shock. They had a meeting in which they made minutes on how can we make sure that no other black person, woman or minority actually joins this organization again. They went to the president of the United States, asked him to write an executive order specifically barring black people, women and naturalized Americans from joining the State Department. And when that didn't work and the president said no, they made sure that no African-American joined the State Department for 20 years after Clinton Wharton. No African-American would join after him for 20 years. And the few that did, they would basically put them in five or four of the same exact countries. So the first five African-Americans who actually did get through it, they basically served 98% of their, um, gosh, I think it was like almost 153 years in the Foreign Service in the same four exact countries. And so even in the 1950s and 60s, as you know, America changed and progressed, the State Department was hostile and fought against the entry of women, African-Americans -Amer African and naturalized Americans. And so by the 1950s, when they couldn't outright ban African-Americans, they used a security clearance process to say African-Americans weren't allowed. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, you did have officers who, who were able to get in, but they were met with hostility. Um, even in the 1950s, I talk about this in my op-ed, uh, one of the African-Americans, Terrence Taubman, when he joined the Foreign Service, um, you know, he wanted like a, a cafeteria, a place to eat. And the State Department opposed him. They said, we don't want to have like an eating facility for you. And after he complained enough about it, what they did was they bought a local restaurant and they partitioned it so that half of it was integrated and the other half was segregated. And so that the white officers who wanted to eat only with white officers could do so on the segregated side. And the officers who wanted to eat with Terrence Taubman could on the other side. And so the State Department for most of its history, modern day history, has been built on keeping people out. The people who built these houses, this house, this foundation of foreign policy, they didn't build this for us, but the house is ours now. These are our places and our facilities now. And we can't take this on by putting on a new paint job. We can't put on this new, let's change the faucet. You know, let's go out and change the garden. No, the people who designed these systems were intentional 
and they're designed and trying to design a system to keep people who were not quote unquote elite out. And so we need to be intentional in how we tack these things. We have to be intentional, long term, and as committed to integration and committed to a better foreign service as they were dedicated and committed to keeping people who weren't like them out of the foreign service. And so you're going to hear a lot of great ideas today. Um, and there's a lot of great things that have been talked about in, in the importance of retention, the importance of recruitment, all that stuff's important. But I think that what happens is, is that a lot of times momentum gets lost, people get tired of the issue, people don't want to talk about it anymore. And what I tell people is that the people in the 1920s and 30s, they didn't get tired of this. They spent 20 years. That's how dedicated they were to this. They spent 20 years of their lives keeping, being like, there's a black person who's taking this oral exam. I'm going to keep that black person out. So the question for us as thought leaders in this topic and the people who want to join these, the State Department and join USAID and join these things, are we going to be as committed to making a better America as they were to making a racist America? And so I think that that's the most important thing and the most important lesson that I would want to convey to, to you guys today is that there's a lot of great ideas, but it isn't the, a lack of ideas isn't the problem. It's a lack of will and a determination on our parts, all of us, and I include myself in that, to make sure that we leave from this situation a better place. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, Terrence Todman was a friend of mine. Terrence Todman uh, was a fabulous ambassador. He was critical in the transition of Spain in 1975, which I'm a student of, of 20th century Spanish history. He played a critical role in the transition to democracy uh, for Spain, in Spain's history. And then he played a very critical role at a pivotal moment in the late 80s, early 90s in Argentina. And when my family needed some help in the early 2000s, I called him because we had my wife's from Argentina and we had a we had a situation and I called him and he really helped my family out. He was a personal friend of mine, he was a personal friend of my family. He was a giant in American diplomacy. I did not know that story and that's that profoundly upsets me. I really appreciate you sharing that that story. Thanks a lot. Juan Cruz, thanks for being here. Hello, Dan. Thanks for having me. I thought I'd start off by uh, sharing a little bit of my background. I uh, retired um, last year after almost 35 years in government, uh, served in a number of countries and in a few agencies. I have a background and experience in the intelligence community and elsewhere. And um, I sort of the pinnacle in the end of my, of my uh, government service was uh, for a year and a half, I served in the White House and the National Security Council and represented uh, the Western Hemisphere. Um, so that's sort of how I, uh, uh, you know, how my uh, career progressed. And I thought what I, one thing that stood out when I was thinking about this uh, earlier was kind of an interesting fact. But um, in the National Security Council, in the five, the last five people who have held my position, the, the eight years of Obama and the four of Trump, out of those five people, um, four of those folk were um, uh, Hispanic. And so if you look at, you know, uh, Honduran American, Colombian American, uh, I'm Puerto Rican, um, uh, Honduran, Pan, uh, is it Colombian, Honduran, Puerto Rican, um, I'm missing, I'm missing folk there. But my point, my point being is that I, I'm sort of surprised to look at that. But I'm also, I also point out that um, the team members tended to be also originally from the region. So those directors that handled the biggest issues ended up also being naturalized U.S. citizens for the, for the most part. Not exclusively, of course. Um, thank you for including me in this conversation today. I think Nicole started off in a powerful way pointing out that this challenge is not new and it's been hanging around for quite a while. And I like the fact that a number of speakers have already married up the issues of recruitment with retention, because this is a really difficult job to recruit uh, the kind of people that we want to represent uh, our America, and then only to lose those people because they don't find that there's a place where they find themselves uncomfortable in the workplace. And so um, uh, it, 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 uh, those two issues go hand in hand. I thought what I would share today as my initial comments would be built around the topic of best practices, because I think that we, that we have cracked the code in some places. And when you crack the code, I think we have a responsibility and should find a better way of sharing 
of doing a better job of sharing what those best practices are. So while some of these may not be revolutionary to most folk who are tuning in, I do I, they are uh, products of my own experience. And I thought I would share uh, some of those um, nuggets of wisdom. First of all, uh, the issue of a visiting scholar or an officer in residence or a diplomat in residence. It goes uh, back to a point that Julie made. It demystifies all these federal agencies. It makes those jobs within the reach of our people, our people who may not believe that they could be a member or an officer in these agencies can quickly find out that this is within their reach. We have a ready resource and a person who is um, who's uh, who can provide uh, information on not only recruitment and retention, but is uh, goes beyond uh, just the classroom. I would also add to that the piece where um, U.S. agencies end up sponsoring or co-sponsoring either chairs or programs or actual institutes in the various universities. That immediately extends uh, uh, their reach and uh, at, of course also demystifies, but it creates um, an instant pool of better informed candidates um, who are uh, have a better grasp of what these jobs actually are and ultimately create a stronger candidate that can be more successful in going through these complicated processes that often entail coming to work for a national security or intelligence or, or defense um, part of the U.S. government. And these, uh, these partnerships, um, because it's really all under partnership, entail everything from uh, some of the agencies, DOD is good at this, intelligence community has contributed to that, but even Congress has helped establish some of these programs that we can take advantage of and help prepare our candidates to be competitive in, the, in uh, applying for these jobs and obtaining them. I also would like to say something because some of these programs are well outside of the DC community and we, we and without, uh, I'm a product of DC schools, uh, universities as well, but the idea is we tend to fish in the same waters. And I think that we, we need to expand a little bit on that. And there's a diversity of geography involved and uh, and and all those universities and programs that are out there that we can that we can spread the wealth and reach out to. And by the way, that chair, that uh, uh, officer in residence, has an enormous impact when you're talking about those parts of the United States where it's uncommon to have the presence. Um, I'll also put a plug in for something that my own school does that I think has become invaluable is is the piece about alumni networks and then the universities then. Um, uh, putting together students that are uh, studying or interested in an area with those alums who are already in that uh, line of business and can act as an uh, as an informal or formal mentorship uh, a relationship or someone that can provide left or right parameters or even assist that person through the uh, formal application process um, and form another kind of mentorship. Uh, relationship. And um, lastly, I would I would not underestimate the power of a single individual. And I'm going to share with you a story about that. And uh, I was a recruiter. I, I, I did recruiting for a year and a half. And um, and I, I'd like to use an example of, um, you know, sort of building and exploiting personal relationships. And uh, we had started to go to uh, uh, to a university that uh, had a high number of minorities um, in a state was Texas. And we ended up going to the career planning and placement office. And, and we had, you know, the, the number of um, minority students was very elevated. So we, we went in with a lot of enthusiasm, but found after multiple visits that the investment really wasn't paying off. We were doing something wrong. We were interviewing dozens and dozens of students, but getting ones and twos and threes or onesies and twosies. And so the career plan, planning and placement officer uh, had the, took the interest to sit, to sit us down. And as we walked through the candidates we were looking for, he changed the dynamic of this. And what he ended up doing was saying, the type of people you're looking for, the people who ended up getting picked up by you are from one of our specialized programs that does a, a dual MBA JD. And most of those people, curiously enough, are Americans from a who originally are from the Caribbean or, you know, or from um, uh, Africa, either them or their parents. And they have a different interest in these sorts of things. And they don't know how to get from here to Washington. They don't see that. And but they have an, a natural interest. And so what he started to do was he started to have a different kind of relationship and bring together um, only one to three candidates. So we, when we showed up at the university, we, we didn't interview three dozen, but we interviewed three. 
And those three were really powerful candidates that we found ourselves inviting to Washington for a second processing. So the power of a single individual who can make a successful, who really cares, and who can find a marriage um, of something like that. Um, so anyway, well, I haven't said anything uh, revolutionary. Hopefully I've said something useful. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thanks a lot, Juan. I, we're, uh, Margarita and I think we're going to take notes on what you had to say, and we're going to produce a, a, an America's uh, product out of this. So this is your, so you're doing working double time. You didn't know it. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. So Tonia, thanks for being here. I really appreciate you uh, joining us. I, I, I turn the floor over to you, Tonia. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, wow, everything that everyone has already said is really so important. I particularly appreciate Chris's remarks about the historical context. I think that um, it's a really good place to start with an understanding of, of what exactly it is that we're working with. Um, I will say that for me, um, as a director of the Bunch Center at Howard, which houses um, the Wrangell, Pickering, and Payne Fellowship Programs, which are fellowship programs that are specifically efforts to diversify the Foreign Service of the State Department and USAID, um, <clears throat> We have to, even though those three programs are housed at Howard University, we continue to work very hard to reach out to our students on Howard's campus and, and other students from diverse backgrounds across the country. Um, even though it's on Howard's campus does not necessarily automatically mean that uh, it's easier for Howard students to get into the program or even that our students are particularly interested in getting into the program. I think one of the things that um, HBCUs, we're, what we are doing, uh, there's, as you said, 105 historically black colleges and universities throughout this country who are working very hard to, um, to promote international careers across the spectrum of careers, whether it is defense, diplomacy, or uh, what's the third one? development, <clears throat> but, <laughs> um, but oftentimes at HBCUs, there are not uh, numerous staff members who are dedicated uh, to this particular effort. And so we, you know, at Howard and the Bunch Center, we have the whole fellowships teams and we work very closely with them. But in terms of my staff, there are only four of us um, who are doing everything else. Part of what we're doing um, are <clears throat> we are uh, we host the study abroad office at the Bunch Center, but we also do global programming. So we invite speakers to come and speak on campus to a variety of international topics that complement the in classroom learning of our students so that our students can meet and network with experts and real world practitioners uh, in whatever field it is that they're interested in. Um, I think that it would be, <clears throat> it is important to, um, to understand that uh, study abroad, we know we are in International Education Week this week and <clears throat> the Open Doors Report from the Institute of International Education was released yesterday. Um, if you take a look at that report and if you look at that report for the last 10, 15, sometimes 20 years, you will notice that the number of African Americans that participate in study abroad is very, very low. Uh, this year, it came out at 6.4% of the total US college uh, students who are studying outside of this country. If we look at employers in defense development and diplomacy, and you ask what are some of the skills that are being looked at when we're hiring, often for those, feet, for those uh, sectors, it is a study abroad experience. Well, if only 6.4% of African-Americans, and that's not to speak of other uh, underserved communities, uh, if that's the number that we're working with, then it's going to be a hard climb, hill to climb to, to fill these positions if, if those that are doing the hiring are looking for experiences like that. So <clears throat> one of the things that we're doing is of course, working to increase the number of students from our institutions who are participating in study abroad experiences because we know from the data that that does 
increase employability, it increases uh, salary, and not to mention all of the other wonderful skills that you develop have after having that kind of an experience. Um, the other thing that I will mention is, um, uh, I think Nicole mentioned uh, unpaid internships and, and how that uh, creates, um, it creates challenges for many students at HBCUs. Our, uh, probably a lot of people on this call are familiar with Patricia Roberts Harris. She was a Howard University alum. She was also the first black female ambassador um, to, of the United States ever. Um, she was ambassador to Luxembourg and upon her death, she left in her part of her estate an endowment to Howard University to be able to provide stipends for Howard University students to be able to accept unpaid internship uh, positions in an effort to help equalize that opportunity. That program has been dormant for 12 years. We just restarted it this year with a, an a cr incredible cohort of Howard University students who are interested in both public affairs and international affairs. Um, but efforts like that, I think, are going to be necessary to continue to move the needle. Um, I think there is definitely a lot of work that needs to be done. And I know that my colleagues at HBCUs are working very hard. We have a um, we have a group me. I was looking at it before we started this call, and I have 113 faculty and staff from HBCUs in a group me called HBCU International Initiatives, and it's just really our effort to stay in touch with each other, share opportunities, because a lot of times the opportunities I get them. I'm in Washington D.C. I'm at Howard University, but other schools in North Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama do, do not have as easy access to information as I do in the nation's capital. So we try to share out uh, information from, from what we receive here at Howard with our colleagues and vice versa. Um, and we try to collaborate whenever possible um, because we all recognize that this is uh, an effort that will take all of our input um, and commitment and dedication to literally change the face of the Foreign Service. Great. I've got some questions from the audience, and I'm hoping this group might go five or seven minutes over. If you guys are all amenable, this panel is amenable to it, I would be super grateful. So from Clifton Jeffrey of the State Department Bureau of Diplomatic Security, uh, Pickering and Rangel Fellowships have close relationships with Howard University. Have there been any research on what percentage of HBCU students come from Howard and a few other HBCUs in comparison to the large number of HBCUs, 107, he puts here across the nation. I often run into HBCU, HBCU students who are unfamiliar with the fellowships and HBCUs are more largely represented throughout the South. So my question is, if we are not seeing a diverse mix of students from HBCUs joining international career fields, how do we more aggressively get those outside of the DC Beltway more involved? How about an engineering fellowship at Tuskegee? Where are our DIRs hosted? How many DIRs are hosted DIRs of diplomats and residents? How many DIRs are hosted at HBCUs? Specific to Julie, you mentioned a fellowship targeting in fellowship targeting in recruiting mid-level professionals. I believe next generation, please correct if inaccurate. Is this an issue exclusive to the State Department? Can you please share how those interested can receive more information? So this is a pretty interesting question. Why don't I start with Tunia and then maybe ask Julie to, 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 to respond as well if anyone else wants to join in. I've got some other questions. Tonia? For, I know for the Wrangell program, historically Howard has tended to have a higher number of uh, fellows accepted into the program. That number dipped in the last couple of years. I know that Spelman is regularly represented. Uh, I can't be sure about which other HBCUs, but there are a sprinkling of other HBCUs. But um, I think it's also important to understand, for example, at Howard, only three years ago did Howard develop an international affairs major. Uh, we, had, we have now an interdisciplinary international affairs major, but it's only three years old. And I was looking just at a couple of HBCUs before we got on the call and, and the number of of HBCUs with international affairs as a major is very low. Um, I, I don't have exact numbers, but um, I think it will be important to look at, you know, what are the other um, fields, areas that 
would speak to the needs of the foreign service and the other sectors that we're talking about here in terms of technical backgrounds or you know fields of study that um, that would qualify them for these fellowships but recognize that international affairs which is very common at some of the more fre frequent of, of the schools where fellows more frequently come from that is something that is part and parcel of their of their academic program but not necessarily so for HBCUs. Julie, do you want to chime in here? Yeah, I'll just add, and as I referenced before, we have uh, diplomats in residence at seven HBCU universities out of a total of 16. Um, but what you mentioned is exactly on the nail. We have to go beyond George Washington University, Georgetown, and SICE. We have to go out and reach a diversity of, our, of the regions um, beyond the, the Capitol Beltway. So that's exactly what we're trying to do in terms of the recruitment. I think we have a great program in the hometown diplomats as well, where diplomats go back home and will speak to colleges and, and high schools in their own region and from where they grew up. And just two examples of uh, my colleagues, Stacey Williams and Blakeney Vasquez, who came from HBCUs, uh, they came from Hampton University and Southern University. And so going beyond just the traditional IR programs, and reaching out to a broader swath of students and really explaining why they belong in the Foreign Service is, is a really important tool. And then just to answer your question on the next gen fellows, that is something that we started here in the Western Hemisphere Affairs Bureau. We hope that this expands throughout the whole building, but this is something that we just uh, launched as a pilot just last month uh, within our bureau when we looked internally to look at how can we look at mid-level officers with the diverse swath pool and make sure they have all the tools to be able to succeed into the senior ranks. Does anyone else want to comment on this? Because I've got other questions otherwise. I think let me go ahead and, 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 and go. Okay, so I've got another question. What has been your number one challenge to increasing diversity in your field? This is from Jasmine George of the Morehouse School of Medicine. So let me start with um, Anno. Can I ask you to, to comment on this? Yes, I, I would say two things, and we've touched on it already, is um, going beyond the usual schools um, to, to find the candidates. I think that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of outreach, um, because there's a um, the information is, is not getting clearly across. Our systems of, and this is in the non-foreign service, in the civilian service, I mean, the process of application to government can be quite complicated. Our job descriptions, you know, could be half the length that they are. And I, I think that, you know, that, 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 that getting beyond to what is what we usually do to be innovative. Um, at, at USTDA, for example, we, we started a, a university champions program to just get beyond where we were typically, because you know, it's a lot of word of mouth. People know people and you end up with the, with the same schools represented. It's making a, a particular effort um, to, to, to get beyond to get beyond that. Um, and, and I will come back to, um, again, letting people know that, and I think this goes beyond the comfort level of how we usually advertise, um, that there is work to be done, um, appealing work to be done, mission focused work to be done, diplomatic. I mean, I, you know, you hear the word commercial diplomat. It's a real thing and the work is interesting and we just need to get the word out um, about those opportunities. There's a lot of work to be done there. Okay, Juan, can I ask you to comment on this, Juan? Uh, certainly, I'm gonna answer it from a slightly different angle in that I was thinking um, the challenges also come from our own communities. Sometimes uh, we, we face when we're trying to uh, recruit from a poll of candidates, it turns out that we've learned that if those candidates came from uh, countries originally or their parents did that were repressed, it's really interesting on their perspectives of working for security agencies or police agencies or the government. It has a sort of connotation uh, or can have a sort of connotation. So you have to work extra hard at, at you know, showing who we are and that we're not, we're not those, you know, in the U.S., we're not like those, those other uh, countries. The other, the other piece I would say is um, the question sparked in me was the issue of self-selecting out. I see a lot of our candidates, they look on the list of requirements 
and they say, well, I don't have this, and I don't have this, and I don't have this, and they self-select out. And when the opposite should be occurring, I think in our communities, I, I have this, I have this, I have this, but I don't have these other four issues. I'm going to take a stab at it. And we need to create a little more of the um, confidence to do that. Um, I just think we're, we're missing something out on, on that where our, our folk are self-selecting self out. Okay, great. Okay, so I, this is a question for for Chris. Uh, thank you for sharing the historical context of the in, in, intentional exclusion of minority foreign service officers. The inf this information sh should be shared more to continue to strive for progress and equity. With the plethora of knowledge and experience I presumed you gained as a previous commissioned foreign service officer and a person of color, what advice would you have told your younger self in the beginning of your US government career from Pauline Melvin, of the WHO? I um, I would have told myself, um, I don't know if I would have told myself anything different. I think I would have told myself to, to really just focus on, um, um, I would have probably been a lot more intentional as a foreign service officer. I, I think this actually goes back to the prior question in terms of understanding that people who come from different backgrounds uh, don't necessarily know how the quote-unquote game is is played um, in the State Department or in any agency, really. And so for me, my mom was a secretary. Uh, my stepdad was a mechanic. Uh, I didn't get a passport till I was 24. Um, and so, you know, when I joined the Foreign Service and they said, well, who wants to go to Lagos, Nigeria? Um, and I said, yeah, of course I'll go because, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's what you do as a State Department person, not realizing that all my white colleagues were saying, oh, no, if you send me there, I'll quit the Foreign Service, you know? And so, and I, I love Nigeria. It was a great experience for me. But I realized, though, that, um, you know, that the people in the State Department might not have looked at Nigeria in the same way. Uh, and so in Nigeria, you know, in a lot of African posts, we met a lot of African-American officers um, and a lot of them. And just like in Asia, there are a lot of Asian officers and in um Latin America, a lot of Latino officers. Um, and maybe that's a part self-selection, but it's also a part of some of the bureaus and some of the decisions that you make when you don't have mentors and people to tell you that, hey, you know, if five black officers all go to Brazil, um, you know, that might not be strategically the best thing for all five of us to do. Um, and so I think that that's the kind of advice and stuff I would have given my, my younger self. I still would have gone to Lagos, but I think I would have... Um, been much more aware that my uh, my white colleagues um, know had a better understanding of the way the game was played, and I don't think I really learned how the game was played until much later in my foreign service career. And then by then I was already out the door. So I, I, yeah, I think there are things like that I would have told myself. I think I would have told myself to be a lot more patient um, <laughs> with a lot of my work colleagues because I think that you know for a lot of minorities when they join these organizations, they have something called like an imposter syndrome, but they feel like they don't belong there. Um, you know, and I, I think that I would have told myself, you belong here. Um, and the question is, is that a lot of your colleagues don't belong here. <laughs> you belong here, but a lot of them don't belong here. And so don't be so hard on yourself um, in thinking that you don't belong here. So I think those are like the two things I would have told my younger self. All right. So I've got one last question. Then I'm going to ask everyone to kind of give like a final thought. You've heard a lot of different things. I guess you give kind of like one minute, but I'm going to put one question and I'd like one or two people to take a stab at this. And then once you be thinking about your one minute parting thought, okay. So, so here's, I've gotten several questions along these lines, which is like, hey, it's not just international affairs people that we need to recruit into government. This is a little bit to Eno's point, this is a little bit to Juan Cruz's point. And that's why I wanted to have a diverse set of, of stakeholders on the, on the stage here. It's like, so agriculture, natural uh, resource management, engineering, social sciences, behavioral sciences. So this is AID, for example, uh, my, my spiritual home in Washington is AID. We don't necessarily need dip, straight up diplomats. We need technical experts with masters or PhDs or strong undergrads with a, maybe a, with some additional work experience in a particular field, anthropology or biology or something else. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of the development challenges or microfinance or economics or engineering, et cetera. So here, let me use, so that's the, the premise. And let me just, so that's to say, this is from this is from Jasmine George of Morehouse School of Medicine. I'm currently pursuing a PhD within the STEM field, biomedical science. Are there opportunities available for scientists wanting to enter this field in government service? So let me ask someone to take on this issue of sort of the broader, we don't need just straight up diplomats. I'm all for diplomats, don't get me wrong, but that we need these technical skills. Could somebody speak to this? Maybe it's Tonia, maybe you, you wanna take a crack at this or is there somebody else at NO, do you wanna take a stab at this? 
I can I can start. I, I I will say. I mean, this has been the the song that I've been singing really since I arrived at Howard five years ago. Is that um, yes, we're here talking about these three specific sectors: development, de de defense, and diplomacy. But there are so many careers available in the international space that um, we have to broaden our minds a little bit. And at Howard, what we're trying to do is explain and show to our students that no matter what discipline it is that they are studying, there is an opportunity for an international career, just even within the foreign service. And we've had so many conversations about all of the, I mean, the foreign, the embassies need doctors. So you can be a doctor at an embassy. A lot of people don't know that. And I, there's a whole, I'm, I'm gonna let the, the foreign, the diplomats speak to that, but there are so many opportunities for any number of different fields and, and areas of expertise to serve uh, in the US government. And a lot of agencies have an international uh, agent, like subunit or whatever you wanna call it. Um, and we've been talking with USDA. I think we're gonna start something with them soon, uh, similar to Wrangell and Pickering. Um, we've had conversations with defense uh, agencies as well. Um, to try to help all, listen, everybody, and not just not just international spaces, literally everybody has realized in the last few months that there is a diversity issue in this country. It doesn't matter what sector it is that we're talking about. And I will say that a lot of them have called us at Howard University, and we're happy to help address all of the issues. We have 13 schools and colleges. We can help with lots of different things. But um, I, I would hope that anybody on the call would, would reach out to the closest HBCU or HSI and offer your area of expertise, volunteer, donate some money, so forth, whatever you can do. Um, there is a lot of work to be done uh, in so many levels. Let me just let me just add to that, Tani, and then I'll turn to Anno, and, and then I'm going to ask each of you to give you a one-minute parting thought. But So, for example, I think we're going to have in the future a big need for veterinarians. Like, and there's gonna be 10 other why veterinarians because we're all doing the Zoom thing is because of the concept of one health and the concept of something called zoonotic transfer. We, we, there's a lot of different reasons for this, but it's urbanization, changes in human diets as we move up the development curve, uh, deforestation, other reasons, airplane travel. All that means that there's a lot more rubbing up of people with animals and therefore a higher probability of the transfer of a funny name disease from, a, from an animal to a human. And that's why we're all sitting in our basements doing Zoom calls because of zoonotic transfer. So we're gonna be recruiting a lot more veterinarians for the concept of something called One Health, which has to do with animal and human health is interconnected and interdependent. So, so think about sciences, including veterinary mm -hmm. science as something that we're gonna be recruiting for. Cause I, I don't wanna be doing this in five years. I'm not up for another do, doing a Zoom, 18 month Zoom in my basement thing again. I, I'm just not up for it. So Eno, uh, you wanna take a stab at this? Cause I think TDA is a specialized agency. And I think it's a little bit to some of the comments about we need technical experts. And, and so in some ways TDA is sort of a tech specialized agency, if I can describe it that way. Uh, absolutely, because the agency focuses on the development of infrastructure in sectors like energy, in sectors like in uh, ICT and transportation. Uh, and so, you know, you if you come with that expertise, it's going to be leveraged and used immediately the other part of what the agency does is to ensure that we that the projects are being developed where there is a possibility a strong possibility of exports of goods and services to be able to really address some of those critical um, uh, issues so you know a business sense a sense of partnership with the private sector it's another skill set so I, I come back to and, and I really and I, I adopt Chris's um, perspective on this. I, I'm, I'm still feeling a bit sore about Nigeria, but I do adopt the, the <laughs> perspective on the fact that we need to think completely differently. Um, and, and so, you know, again, I come back to, do we look at some way of recruiting across the board to, uh, to a system that can train and 
uh, you know, accept people with different skill sets and then funnel them to the different needs. I, I need to develop that a little bit more uh, carefully and will do in writing, but I think we do need to look at this differently because we are losing the ability to leverage a variety of skill sets, a diversity of people, regional and geographic diversity, and we've got to find a way to um, address it. Okay. Okay, so uh, Nicole, I wanna just telegraph that I'm gonna give you the last word at the end if you wanna just think about this, okay? So, so let me start with Juan, what's your one minute, what's your one minute takeaway from this discussion? I'm gonna give uh, some of your time back because what I wanna do is, is be brief and, and in the discussion, uh, one of the things that distresses me is that we've all seen this um, before and for, for too long, but as long as people that are on this call are involved, I have, um, great optimism so that we can move away from, from the times we've gotten it right to those times that we're going to, I'm sorry, the times we've gotten it wrong to those times that we get right. All of us like to see ourselves mirrored in organizations that we join. And what distressing, if you're these pioneers that we've mentioned today that were among the first, how difficult it would have been for them. But guess what? We're not going to be among the first, right? And so we have an onus and an obligation being inside to help those that are trying to identify and find a way to work their way through the system, whether it's in recruitment or retention. So if we focus on uh, issues like sponsorship, mentorship, partnership, internships, all the ships, and then I would end with volunteerism. What we need to be, all of us need to give more. Those of us who are in the inside need to give more to make it easier and open access to those who are trying to get in and stay in and be constructive. So that's, that's all I'll say. Thanks Juan. Chris Richardson. Um, all I would say is, you know, what we should always be thinking about is seven minutes and 46 seconds. That's what we're talking about because of George Floyd and what happened to him. That's why we're having this conversation. That's why we've all been having these conversations on Zoom is because of what happened to him. And I think that, again, the ideas aren't the problem. Lots of people have lots of great ideas. The problem has always been the will and the commitment to change. Um, and so if you out there are someone who's thinking about the foreign service field or any kind of diplomatic field, uh, if you're looking at the international world and you want to represent America, do it. Please do it and realize that, you know, the things that brought America this conversation about race just can't end um, when the pandemic ends or it can't end when we get bored of it. Um, it really has to be an ongoing, continuing, lifetime conversation that we all have to have in every field and in every job that we take on. Um, and so I, I just ask that people remember why we're having this conversation, remember why we're having this year and this summer that we had of, of, of racial discussions um, and that we don't forget that and we don't lose sight of why we're all even doing this stuff. Okay, Julie Chung. Thanks. Uh, what I really wanted to emphasize is that recruitment is not enough. You know, we are pretty good at recruitment now. We need to, of course, continue to recruit. But the retention and the promotion, getting people to those senior levels is critical. It's not enough to have diversity in our junior ranks. So to create that pipeline so that people have that level playing field to be able to compete for senior positions and be the senior policymakers in the foreign and civil service, I think that is critical. And the second point is to let everybody know who's out there, who's listening, who's considering a career in the State Department, that you belong. Don't ever let anybody tell you you don't belong. We may not be a diverse boardroom right now or in many senior meetings. And I sometimes look around and I am the only woman or the only woman of color. And don't let that deter you. And I wish there were more of us who could have provided a network for, for Chris and when he was in the Foreign Service to tell you this is the way to do it. This is the way we can sponsor and network and, and create that pipeline for you. And we're working hard at it. Many of us are dedicated and passionate about this. So if you're even considering that there is a meaning and a purpose uh, beyond just going to a job and, and making a salary, the Foreign Service, serving your country is really the best way to do it. And we need diversity in every sense of the word. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So, Eno. 
Um, I think I would just uh, come back to actually, I'm going to use the word urgency of the situation because the world is changing, it's changing fast. Um, and, you know, it's very diverse out there. And some of those very diverse people have very powerful weapons and have, um, you know, really, really positions that might not be to our uh, benefit. So I think to be successful as a country, to be able to compete, to be able to have influence, we need to definitely um, systemize our ability to recruit and, as everybody has said, retain new people, new kinds of people who have new perspectives, different skills, different knowledge. Um, and really, I think it's an important point as well, the cultural competence to be able to um, make sure that our best interests as a country are served. Good. Tonia. Um, three things. I would say to those who are doing the hiring, be intentional about who it is that you're looking for and what candidate pool you are drawing from. If what you're looking for is diversity, then we are here, you should find us. But it's not too terribly hard. To those who are watching who are HBCU students and looking for a career in international space, my personal advice is learn a language. I'm personally am a langu foreign language uh, cheerleader. And I think it is very important for us, especially to learn another language. And lastly, support an HBCU. If you're an alum of an HBCU, write a letter to the president, send some coins and say, you would like to see that institution spend a little more time and energy on international programs and activities. If you didn't go to an HBCU, send a letter anyway, also send some coins, that's always welcome, and say that this is something that you would like to see because you believe that uh, our students should be the face that represents our country. So those are my three things. I love it. This, I love it, T Tunia, I love it. The, the language issue, oh my gosh, we, you know, French is the language of the future because of Africa, there's going to be, not, there's a billion people in Africa, 25 years from now, there's going to be 20, 2 billion people in Africa. There's going to be more people in Africa than Chinese citizens and Indian citizens combined 25 years from today. So that means speaking French matters. Portuguese is going to be a little bit more as a, as a language of the future between Brazil and the Lusophone world. Uh, yeah, of course, everyone speaks English. That's great. And it will still be a lingua franca. But if we want to be effective, speaking Spanish changed my life, totally changed my life. And I would argue that if you learn a, a second language fluently, effectively, it's worth several million dollars in income and other sorts of things. There's some, I, I, you can't, you, someone ought to do an economics study on this, but at least three million, maybe it's five million bucks. You're going to get it back over your lifetime learning a second language fluently not asking where's the bathroom and can I have no a coke with no ice please but like actually have a diplomatic discussion and, and convince people you know move people etc it's so critical thank you for that I amen amen okay so okay who uh, Nicole I'm giving you the last word look I just want to say thank you to everybody for being here this was a, a fantastic discussion um I, I really want to point out here that there's a community out there of us that are professionals. You know, a couple of our panelists mentioned that. We are out here. There are those of us that have been in this space for, for many years. So you can find a mentor, you can find a community. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions. We're here, that's what we exist for. This is, this is what we do. Um, and then secondly, just I just wanted to say on the technical expertise side, I entered government with my Russian studies um, background and was put in technical training because I worked in nuclear nonproliferation and WMD nonproliferation. And that is all technical. I worked with engineers, I worked with MDs, I worked with uh, structural engineers. I worked mostly with technical people that we were cross training each other on technology and, and policy. So if you are an engineer, if you're in medicine, I strongly encourage that you look at that, that area. You are really needed, not only in that, but in technical advancement on the uh, defense policy side and the defense technology side. But anyway, I just wanna close out and say thank you again. And we are here, we are here. Excellent. Thank you everybody for doing this. 
I think there's a larger project, Nicole, for CSIS to be doing on this. And I know you and I have talked about this. So one of the things I want to just put out there to our audience is, look, we think there's there's potentially a working group. If we could find the right philanthropy or the right uh, corporate sponsor, we think there's a larger agenda about how do we, some of the ideas here, I think there's a, there's a kernel of something really good. So I'm going to shamelessly just put it out there and say, we've got, we, I think we could, we could put a real bang up project on this. There's going to be a, there's, this is a time of change here in Washington. And so the timing for something like this would be pretty good. So come find us, come find Nicole, go find me. And we'd like to do something, you know, we'd like to continue this conversation, but you know, like everything else in life, we need a little bit of oxygen to do that. So uh, that's my public service announcement pitch and my shameless pitch. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, panelists. I'm so grateful. And thank you, audience, for being here. This is great. Thanks so much. Thank you.